Imagine working with cutting-edge startups to help them tackle some of the biggest problems that we face in the world. This episode's guest does just that. In this episode, I speak to Krista Jones, founding executive of the Momentum Program and VP of Venture Services at Mars Discovery District, about helping startups grow into companies that will build a better future and the importance of enabling people to work at their best. Those types of rapid changes in technologies that are enabling people who are at the core of successful enterprises is actually one of the greatest innovations that has come out of the last 10 years. Krista Jones has been the driving force behind the creation of Momentum, a Mars program helping scaling Canadian companies reach $100 million in revenue by 2024. Krista has been a passionate innovator and builder of technology-based businesses for over 30 years and brings a human-centered approach to business value creation. So, ready to learn more about how startups can grow to change the world? Let's discuss. I'm Rebecca Scott, and this is Humans Now and Then. Krista Jones, thank you for joining me. Happy to be here, Rebecca. So we had a great conversation a few weeks back about the amazing work that you're doing in Canada around enabling startups to be successful and enable those ventures to make a big difference. So I'd love to learn a little bit bit more about your work around helping enable startups in, in your communities. Great. I work at an organization called Mars Discovery District, which is a large scale innovation hub uh, located in Toronto, in Ontario, Canada. And the mission behind Mars is really then to help ensure Canada's economic and social future by enabling science and tech based startups to be successful and to build a culture of entrepreneurship and innovation in Canada. You know, Mars has been around for about 15 years now, I guess, and I've been there 12 years helping to do this work. And we started with helping more people start businesses, and then we started to help them get over the first 10 million in revenue to try to get some traction and and be created. But what I'm doing right now is the global first in that we're focused on the next stage of startup, which is the large companies that are going from 10 million to 100 million in revenue and trying to get more Canadian headquartered larger companies that will help anchor the Canadian economy going forward. It's a very social mission that we want to secure the future for Canada, uh, the economic future, as well as for our children, so they have great places to work. And it's interesting because the work that we do, we're not trying to duplicate Silicon Valley or Israel or some of the other places around the world that have a great track record of building these bigger companies. Our mission is uniquely Canadian. And what we're trying to do is build companies that not only make money, i.e. the $100 million target in revenue, but we want them to be great places to work, great places and great employers. And we also want the types of problems that they're solving to be global problems. Inside the program that I'm running, we have somebody working on all of the 17 UN social development goals that they've listed as areas that the world needs help, all the way from climate change to drug discovery to making better places to work and employment right across the whole gamut. So that's what's really exciting about what we're doing here. Yeah, it's it's quite an amazing mission, really, you think about it. So not even just bolstering the Canadian economy and the spirits of entrepreneurship there in Canada, but also what an amazing thought about all the difference that can be made to really facing and taking on the world's biggest challenges and getting involved at that global scale. And I'm interested to know what are the biggest challenges that these organizations have in making that leap into a large Um, enterprise that could really take on these big problems that we face in society? So in Canada, we have always had great history and great expertise on the technical side, on the product side, right? We create some of the best tech in the world, and we have great academic institutions that allow us to do that. And global companies have been coming to Canada to hire our talent and to buy our companies for years. So when we look at the challenge that we're faced and how we've centered this program, we start with the people. To be able to transverse 
10 to 100 million is a journey that requires a particular brand of expertise, a particular brand of knowledge that we don't have enough of, frankly, in Canada across all of the executive levels. The way we know to start this is by starting and enabling the people layer, the executive layer in these organizations, because they have the greatest impact on how you can build and go global with these solutions. By the time they get to 10 million, the product is already established and created. And what we need now is great leaders who know how to build, maintain a culture, develop diverse employee groups, and really launch globally. Right. And I think that's a big lift for companies that think about their growth and their scale and the importance of them engaging their people in order to reach those large audacious goals that companies could have in taking on these big challenges. And I really like the the fact that you brought up the importance of good leadership in that dynamic, because good leadership, of course, is going to bring people forward, bring the best out of those people and prepare them to better shape the future. So what are some of the advantages or some of the changes you've seen in some of these companies that make that lift? put into effect this effective leadership that really brings people up and engages them further to help them shape that future that they envision? So, you know, one of the biggest changes that happens for companies when they actually get all of their leaders, their executives going in the same direction is confidence and speed and decision making. So we're just coming through the pandemic and uh, through, well, actually, we're not through it. We're in the middle of it. And one of the things that was really amazing to me was the companies in this program that we're dealing with and how they were able to get through this with a minimal amount of layoffs as possible. Companies are only as good and they're only going to be able to, in the long run, perform as great as their culture and their people help them to do. The fact that they were able to come through this and we supported them heavily through this period, supported them in just encouraging each other, teaching them how to go to remote work, and the speed at which they were able to have confidence in their decision making really has made a difference. And in some cases, their ability to pivot to solutions that actually are helping the world during this time, like whether they're tests for COVID, whether they're remote work solutions, whether they're enabling digital customer service for the retail industry, all I think was vital to maintaining their progression forward on their mission to build these companies. Yeah, that's fascinating. And so I'm also wondering, when you're talking about kind of bringing people up and really building them to give them the skills that they need, because one of the things too, beyond just enabling the people today, getting them engaged, giving them a stake in the game, right, to really buy into and feel a part of this evolution into something bigger, whether it be as an organization or something bigger they're trying to solve in the world, the folks in these organizations need to have those skills to help them prepare for the future of work. And so what are the, some of the things that either your organizations do or what would, what advice might you give to organizations that are looking to enable their employees and give them the skills they need to prepare for that future of work? You know, it's, it's interesting, Rebecca, when you, when you say the future of work, I always have a, a hard time with the word future because what is the future to somebody, you know, of my generation versus future to a millennial? in today's workforce are very, very different futures in terms of where they're headed and what they're and where they're at today. And I would say that the pandemic has enabled what pre-pandemic was called the future of work, which is this digitization, or as I call it, I think the intelligent enterprise is this need to enable employees with digital tools such that they can do their work in very collaborative, but remote and online ways. And what was interesting is kind of before the pandemic, we're talking a lot about automation. And now as we're in the pandemic and we're in this new remote way of working, we're actually, we actually did, I think we probably did 10 years of progression towards the future of work inside of six months. And the advice I always give everybody is not to be afraid of tech and not to be afraid of the use of tech. And to always make sure that as you're deploying the tech, not just that that your product is technical, but the tools that your employees use, that you keep in mind that they're there to support the people layer of your organization, not to automate it out, but to make it such that they can focus on the tasks or the work that need uniquely human intervention to get done. 
not to provide knowledge, but to enable the creativity of the people in the organization. If I'm advising anybody on it, I start with talking to them about who their employees are and what is their intelligent digital strategy that they need to move forward. And one of the good news about tech startups or the startups that I work with is that they tend to be made up of employees who are not adverse to tools. We always say that these companies, they're a bit of a precursor to what uh, larger enterprises are heading towards because they are built with tech or uh, science-minded individuals at the core. Right. And that is interesting. Really makes you push yourself beyond the technology and the digital aspects of what an organization needs to compete in today's day and age. What are the actual needs, desires, a direction of the folks in the organization? How do you help enable them to bring those unique strengths? that align to their own purpose, their own direction in life, where they are in life, to your point, because that was an excellent point. It's very true that not everybody in an organization are looking for the same things in life or might be at different life stages and might have different needs to help enable them to be successful. So it can be very complex, but very valuable to identify the individual needs or all the various needs or understand the various needs of your employees across your organization and ensure that they're set up uh, to help uh, the organization meet its goals, but also ensure that the individual employees can align their own purpose, their own values, and their own vision of future towards what that company is driving towards. Exactly. And, you know, one of the stats that is always astounding to me is that this is the first time in history that we have five generations of people still in the workforce. And and if you think about the fact that we have five generations of people, and then in the last 10 years, we have seen some of the most astonishing uh, movements in technology and products and what we can accomplish with tech and um, the ability to embed empathy into the technology and the way technology is deployed is a large part of what will make businesses successful so that they can actually now provide multiple ways for different people in an organization because we have diversity in age, we have diversity in race, we have diversity in cultural aspects and just even where they're located, right? And that's the ability to provide preference in how people access is one of the great things that has developed in technology in the last 10 years. Because if we think about, I've been at Mars 12 years and when I started there, the technology innovations we were looking at were mobile apps was the onset of mobile apps. It was, and now mobile access is just a given. It's almost the same as a phone was. You know, you can't imagine an organization that doesn't have a mobile way for their customers to connect with them. And so those types of rapid changes in technologies that are enabling people who are at the core of successful enterprises is actually one of the greatest innovations that has come out of the last 10 years. Wow. That, yeah, that is interesting to think about how our day-to-day lives have changed. The things have become givens, not even just in business, but in our lives, the things we expect it does really speak to the fact that we are evolving how we behave. We're evolving our expectations out in the world and also as organizations. And it's interesting as that synergy continues to evolve into the future, because you're not just talking about organizations that evolve over time. You're also talking about an evolving customer base with evolving needs and evolving expectations that you have to continually meet. In order to do that, you need to have a good mix of people from different backgrounds. Like you said, the importance of diversity, having people from different backgrounds and different experiences. And how do you engage the right people at the right time where they're at with their perspectives and with their potential expectations or a great deep understanding of what their needs might be? If we think about the future of work, one of one of the things that diversity enables us to do is to actually rethink our organizations at the core and to understand that one size no longer fits all. And one size means there's no one way to organize your people. There's no one way to organize your processes. There's no one way to think about your customers anymore. And the complexity that that introduces to us requires a technical layer to enable us to sift through that and make the right decisions at the right time for our customers, for their buying journey, 
for our employees and their employment journey, as well as just for organizations' role in society and, and what they need to do. You know, if I look at the 53 companies that are currently enrolled in Momentum, we have one company that's a holacracy that has been completely remote from day one in the way that they're organized to other organizations that might have in, employed a very traditional org structure and a very traditional you know, management team and approach to other ones that have a flatter organization and that actually have combined and new roles emerging. Like if you think past, we could say a chief operating officer or a head of sales and all of us could imagine exactly what that role was. And you can no longer do that. If you think about the fact that the majority of jobs, I think it's over 50% now, are jobs that didn't exist five years ago. That's a pretty amazing statement. And what that requires is flexibility to enable organizations to make the best of the employee and the context that they have. So they always have to operate in the context of who their customers are and who their employees are. And the companies that are able to tie those two things together, which is the people layer of your business, are the ones I think that will be the most successful in the long term. Absolutely. What you're also talking about is by aligning the purpose and the values in your organization and for your customers. I mean, you're really reducing a whole lot of complexity and really staying very true to your brand and your mission. Absolutely. And what's interesting is for the people in the organization, it also changes their career journeys. It also changes the expectations that they have and how they actually are able to manage the life that they want and still be able to contribute and be an employee and fund the life that they want in in interesting ways. And, you know, whether it's just in the salary that you get or whether it's actually in the work hours that you do and whether sometimes in some cases, you know, we have a lot of debate about the the pros and cons of the gig economy and what that means um, and, and who it's good for. Because the one thing that is still a problem is equity and making sure that we don't leave people behind in this future of work. And that tends to impact all sides of it. And whether it's just, do they act, have access to right skills for this new changing world and the way this new work is being done? Do they want to change? Do they have the right mindset to be able to operate in these kind of employers of the future? It's a very big issue that actually we need as a society to deal with to make sure that we don't leave any groups of people behind as we journey on this rapid, rapid train to the future of work. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think one of the things that I've talked to a few folks on the podcast here, but also out in the world, is how this kind of ever-changing dynamic that you're talking about is building skills and evolving over time to meet the ever-changing need in this rapid pace of change that we're experiencing that just got escalated times 100 when COVID hit. And we are in a place right now where the future is relatively uncertain, especially when we're talking about the midterm future. We get out of COVID. We're not quite sure about the things that will carry forward, the things that have been disrupted that will continue on and really start to shape what our future uh, looks like. So not even just the future of work, but the future of how we operate in the world, the future of how we communicate out in the world, the impact to younger generations that are in the early stages of schooling um, that are being impacted by social distancing. So many things here to think about. So you talk about the five generations we have now. We've got another generation, of course, coming up too, that would be, I don't want to call them the COVID generation, but I'm interested to find out how younger kids will fare as they get older, growing up in maybe a couple years of having to think about or be in this world of social distancing where they're not allowed to share too, which is interesting. It's interesting to think about wh how where that might take us. Absolutely. And, you know, the generation that I worry the most about right now is, is actually the generation that my children are in. Those who have access or are in the middle of education or like leaving high school in university, leaving university, that are being trained still and developed still with curriculum and structures that are very heavily pre-pandemic, like the pre-COVID world. And, and they're going to end up having to work in the post-COVID world, but without the benefit of having access to training or access to knowledge about what that means. So their creativity and their need for 
adaptability to change is going to be very, very high. And that's the group that I think right now is going to be really at a disadvantage entering the workforce in the post-COVID world for them, because they're still squarely in the pre-COVID world, but they won't have the benefit of time to get used to the post-COVID world to be able to access new and different skills that will be required. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of college students struggling with that right now. And I've got two college students right now. I've got another high school student who's starting to think ahead about her future and what she might want to do in life. And we've had those conversations about what will be the careers that will exist eight years from now, 10 years from now. Uh, What should she think about? How should she prepare herself? And one of the things I always say to her is that the biggest skill she's going to need is not a technical skill. It's adaptability and being able to understand how to learn and adapt as things change and potentially even reinvent how you present yourself as far as the world of work and and so forth. It's really interesting to think about, even so much so that companies like Google, just recently, Google announced that they're enrolling a six-month training program that is meant to be a different path uh, into that tech career at Google instead of going to college for, for four years. And so you wonder if those different learning opportunities or different learning avenues will significantly disrupt higher education uh, as we move forward. You know, I I think higher education is being disrupted. So I think we just don't know what it will morph into. There's no way around it. It's just the affordability of it, the structure of it. It was being disrupted pre and it's going to have to change even more dramatically. And I've got two in college right now. And one of my children is in a research and a science program. And that requires lab work. Labs are closed. So you're looking at how do you give people training for things that can't be done remotely, that aren't just knowledge attainment. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges that universities face. You know, they always said just the college experience in that time taught you as much that you needed to grow in the world as actually the attainment of the actual knowledge was. And so I'm like, how do you do that now? When college experience is confined to your room and doing courses online where you're, you're not going into a classroom, you're not seeing that engagement, you're not finding your kindred spirits. So it's going to be really interesting to see how the university landscape morphs to this new reality because they were being disrupted prior. The fact that we will launch that program, to me, that is not a result of COVID. That is a result of everything that was happening pre just in this need and this swell of conviction that we saw And I think the tech community, to say that you don't need the four-year degree, they kind of covered the, I dropped out of university and became a billionaire story. And that to me is the exception to the rule. I still want doctors to be trained. I still want lawyers to prove that they can think out the complex situations that exist, you know, but not everybody needs that. And I think that's what the challenge is, is that the whole education system had been geared for so long in this quest to be Harvard. Like, you know, colleges wanted to be universities and universities wanted to be Ivy League and Ivy League. And and we just had this constant quest, always trying to be something as opposed to just providing the right amount of training for the right amount of time, for the right careers, for the people who needed it. And that's what I think we're going to see change. Absolutely. And then as we start to see the outcomes of that shift, either some of those new approaches towards education will be reinforced or will continue to evolve because ultimately organizations are continuing to search for people that can help them meet the needs of the time and the needs of the near and hopefully far future. But also I think people, as we continue to evolve and move forward, I mean, we're living in this world where things have been moving so fast. A lot of folks have experienced burnout, have been kind of run down. As of um, last year, and I haven't looked at the statistic lately, but about 50% of the workforce had experienced burnout at some point in time. And that's across all industries. It doesn't matter. But of course, in tech, that's usually a pretty common scenario where you have people working really long hours um, under difficult, high-pressure circumstances. Exhaustion and burnout is relatively common. I'm wondering if you've seen that in the organizations that you work with. So some of these maybe even scrappy startups that are working to get to that next level. Maybe that goes back to the importance of leadership, like you mentioned before. How do organizations really make sure to focus on the well-being of their people and their organization as they continue to try to meet um, and achieve these lofty goals? You know, of course we see burnout. 
especially in venture capital backed companies where the pressure for growth and growth at all cost was kind of the hallmark of tech as long as it's kind of been around when you have that kind of desire for returns and you, you know the the VCs are as good as how many exits they've had in in record time and and that's why when you you think about companies and what we're trying to do here is we're trying to foster forms of more patient capital that allow you to build at the pace that your customers and your employees are capable of doing and we spend quite a bit of time and have have elements of our program that's focused on mental health and actually making sure that organizations start thinking about it from the executives on down in terms of being able to do that. We have a startup here called League who's trying to provide a different form of benefits for the organization so that they have ways for people to manage their mental uh, well-being. We've got an organization at Mars that's not part of Momentum, but is an earlier stage that is providing those services. And we try to make sure that um, like online mental health services. And we're trying to make sure that awareness and training and leadership focuses on helping their employees not face that burnout. But it's a hard equation, right? Because you've got these venture-backed companies that have this high need for growth and they're constrained in who they can hire and the ability to bring, sometimes they just can't bring enough people on for the workload that sits in front of them. And that's kind of the ideal conditions for burnout, right? Is when you've got People with the conviction of the mission of the organization, trying to get the work done based on the requirements set by the investors, and it breeds that. So, of course, we have it here. And the only way to get around it, I think, is by providing safe spaces for people to talk about it, to be able to report it, to be able to compensate and provide support for it. And that's what we try to focus on as a big part in our program. Yeah, absolutely. And I think some of the other things that you mentioned that you're doing in the program meet that same goal of helping employees feel you know, motivated, feel like it's, you know, the work they do is al- aligning to their purpose and their values and making a difference in the world. And that really can drive people to feel very passionate and very moved and energized by the work that they do, which I think is also a big factor in protecting burnout, uh, even when you're working many hours. I'm curious to know too, as you work with these startups and looking at these kind of very big goals that your organization has and thinking about the changes this can make in the world, what are some of the things that you might be optimistic about uh, for the future? Oh, there's so much to be optimistic about. For me, the resilience of people is one of the things that gives me great optimism. Uh, You know, they always say that crisis brings out the best or the worst in people. And I'm a glass half full sort of person. And so I believe that right now we're seeing the resilience come forth. And resilience means people being willing to embrace change in a way that they've never had to before and supporting each other through it. Because I think that that is what is actually going to make the future. This whole thing about wear masks, not for yourself, but for everybody else. It's kind of just a little bit of that resilience, a little demonstration of how that is optimistic. And then the second thing that I would have to say I'm optimistic about is that the advances in science and technology that we have seen are already enabling us to do some things that we never thought possible. I I think that, you know, if we think about climate change, if we just were able to get adoption of some of the technologies that already exist, like we don't need to invent something to solve those. We just need to adopt the habits and the technologies that exist. So I'm optimistic that we have a lot of the knowledge, a lot of the science and technology already created that are platforms And when you combine them with these resilient, creative people that we're going to be able to get the world kind of righted and back on its axis and moving forward in our new normal, in the new post-COVID world, I love the phrase build back better. And I love the fact that we can do that because the tech and the science and the people are here that can do that. Yeah, that's the magic synergy right there. You know, getting those things to align, the people, the the organization, the goals, the the difference you can make in the world really are something that we should be very optimistic about or think about the opportunities that are in front of us as people in society, in in our world. I mean, it's just amazing opportunities for people to get involved, amazing opportunities for us to experience as we move forward. But of course, there also are some challenges or like you said, there's big problems in the world that we need to think about and we need to start working towards solving. And um, one of the goals of my show, of course, is try to inspire people to help shape that better future that they envision. 
But what are the, some of the things that you uh, personally are concerned about for the future? One, one of the things I'm really concerned with is what I call the messy middle that we're in, is that there is a lot of people whose livelihoods have been upended by this current environment that we're in. I mean, and we had people that were being upended by automation pre and just the changing of markets and the need for different things. So the thing that worries me and that I spend a lot of time thinking about is how do we make sure that we don't create a world that is only good for the haves and that we're able to think through the solutions and think through the structures and use that empathetic side of us to make sure that we bring everybody into the new world that we're creating right now. I live in my little tech bubble world where everybody is kind of in the have category and we're working hard to bring different perspectives in. And we need to really focus as people on making sure that we don't lose ourselves in the pursuit of individual, that we remember that we live in a very diverse world and that there's a lot of people suffering that we have solutions and money for that we need to be able to help solve. So that's the one part that I think is very worrisome for the future is, are we going to leave a whole bunch of people behind in this journey? And how do we make sure that we don't do that? Because it requires a lot of change. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, those are really good points. And I think even if you think about just some of the social equality initiatives that have surfaced and moved forward recently, I, you know, we hope that some of that will help change the direction to think about how do you make sure that folks in various perspectives, different parts of the world, different areas, different levels of income and privilege have access. But these opportunities, we need to continue to surface so we can bring more people into the conversation about the future, um, see more perspectives and really understand very deeply what the needs are out in the world and what we can do as individuals and maybe as entrepreneurs out there who might be listening, entrepreneurs that can come solve these problems that people are really struggling with to make a better future. So what would be the advice you might give to anyone who might be listening that is an entrepreneur, has a dream of being an entrepreneur, has a big dream to change something for the better? What advice would you give them to get started? You know, part of me wants to say, just begin, take the smallest steps you can do to begin. But the mo I think the most important thing you need to do is find one person who believes in the same vision that you have and that will help you along the way, and then find the next person and the next person. Because the way to get started, it's very lonely to do it on your own and very difficult. You, you know, your success rates increase dramatically just by adding one other person to your idea. And find somebody who's not like you. If you're a business person, find a tech person. If you're a tech person, find a business person. If you're old, find a young person. If you're young, find somebody with a little bit more experience. Like Always try to fill in with people with different interests or knowledge. So that's kind of always the advice I start with is to just find that one person because that's actually how you start to build a following and you start to build conviction on your solution is, is by just doing it one conversation at a time. And so that's usually the best place to begin. I love that. What great advice. So um, I hope everybody out there will take that advice. And as you might know, I really love calls to action. So that was a really good one. So get out there, get started, find some people to surround yourself, to bolster the effort and go change the world. So Krista Jones, this has been an amazing conversation. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. Krista is quite literally at the forefront of shaping the future through her work with Mars Discovery District. She and her colleagues are shaping the Canadian technology landscape, bolstering the regional economy, and helping startups create new and exciting jobs now and in the future. But note what is at the core of her work, people. By helping the people and startups thrive through effective leadership and technological solutions that help them work at their best. They can continue their quest to tackle some of the biggest problems that we face in the world. While we often think of innovators and disruptors as those shaping the future, we must also consider those that enable others to be successful on that path. Beyond those that generate amazing ideas, 
There are those that determine how to apply those ideas to solve real problems, those that help organizations operate at their best, and those who are effective in telling the story to those that will benefit most. Krista mentioned that finding someone who believes in your mission and has complementing skills is one of the first steps that aspiring entrepreneurs should make. So, it's time to step up and explore how to create the future that you envision. While you do that, grab a friend or two to help. Then, go on. Go help shape the future. To learn more about the amazing work that Krista does along with her colleagues at Mars Discovery District, go to marsdd.com. That's M-A-R-S-D-D dot com. Hey, humans out there. Join the conversation on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Humans Now and Then. I'd love to hear from you. I'm Rebecca Scott, and this is Humans Now and Then, hosted and produced by Rebecca Scott. Episode notes can be found at humansnowandthen.com. Thank you for listening.